everybody. Come shoot stories here. Trying to get all my stuff figured out here. Hi, Carol Loving, Alaska. Welcome to the show. We're just getting started and officially beginning at 10 p.m. here in about 14 minutes. Trying to figure out how to make an echo go away. Well, hello, Nin. Hi, Mary Rose. Hello, Nay Folk. Sally Scott. And there's Carol Bailey, wife of Beetle Bailey. And VTPSTTU. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but thank you for being here. George Lopez and Sharon Hargett and Lisa. Glad to have y'all. DJ T Diamonds, Nay Folk. Are you guys hearing an echo at all? I've got one from one of my devices, but if it's not picking up on your end, then we won't worry about it. But somebody let me know in the comments if there's any problems with the audio. Hello, Kush Queen Katie. No echo. Okay. Thanks, Nafolk. Thanks, Nin. So where's everybody from? There's Elliot Ness. A little static. Yeah, I got three devices going here. And I think I might... Um, I don't know. Just trying to figure out what I need to do here. I think we may just have to live with the static. Let's look at where everybody's from tonight. We've got uh, Dallas, we've got Snyder, we've got Ohio, Rochester, New York, Wyoming, Oklahoma, Alaska, North Carolina, Washington, Chicago, Duncanville, Palm Springs, California. Okay, I think I finally figured out my echo issue. Maybe one of these days I will have a producer, but right now I am the producer. All right, shout outs to New Orleans, to Brooklyn, New York, to Toronto, Canada, to Southern Cal. Virginia, the big city of Lancaster. So guys, um, as we get ready for 10 o'clock, we're about 10 minutes away from doing a watch party where we're going to take a look at CBS DFW's uh, website and um, watch a special report that they're going to have on Missy Beavers. I'm not sure 
exactly what the format of it's going to be or how long it's going to be or if it's going to start right at 10. But I will tune in at 10 and, and see what's going on there. Um, I can't really show you the screen of CBS DFW at 10 because that would violate um, copyright and terms of service and all that on YouTube. So um, what I would encourage each of you to do is either on your device, go to your browser and go to cbsdfw.com or on your smartphone or your tablet, download the app for CBS DFW and you can watch live on that and we'll just all kind of watch together on our individual devices. Hello, Shiva's girl from Toronto. Glad you're here. Just one, uh, one quick little note at the outset, um, and I won't uh, dwell on this, but if you if you want to do a super chat and contribute to the channel um it's appreciated if it's something that you can do it uh, certainly not something that i dwell on but i've got some software and stuff that i use for these live chats and everything so it's um you know used to defray that a little bit so if anybody wants to contribute a little bit, I will say no more about it, but uh, it'll be appreciated if you do. I guess while we're waiting a little bit here, we still got about seven minutes. Anybody have any questions? Um, go ahead and type them in the comments and we'll, we'll address those. Um, but to continue on about what we're doing tonight, we're going to have that watch party. Again, I don't know exactly how long it's going to be, the segment on um, CBS DFW. But after that's over, we've got two other things I want to do. I want to let you all know exactly what the mysterious object is. Um, done some investigating and... Um, with a little help from various sources, I've narrowed in on exactly what that mysterious object is that the killer has in their hand as they're breaking out that window in that door with the hammer. In their left hand, they've got this uh, whitish object, and I know what that is. So we're going to talk about that, and uh, then we're going to move on to a virtual tour of the church. And uh, that's going to be kind of neat because uh, that's going to allow us to really kind of see the church in a way that you haven't seen it before. You've seen it from nine or 10 feet up on a surveillance camera with a fisheye lens. Um, but this is going to be eye level cell phone video walking the church it really gives you a feel for exactly what Missy saw and what the killer might have seen uh, and the distances from one hallway to the end of the next. Uh, Shiva's girl asking if I have a PayPal or a Venmo. Um, I actually do have Venmo. I do have Venmo. Let me uh, let me find my Venmo. I've only ever used it for one thing, so I need to see what my username is. I guess it's at Tim Dash Covil, C O V I L. That's my Venmo. So at Tim Dash C O V I L. Okay. Let's. Uh, Let's get caught up on some other people who've joined us. Janet Condon, um, thank you for joining us. 
Kush Queen Katie. Yeah, I'm excited for this virtual tour, too. I think uh, it'll be enlightening. Elliot Ness says you should take guesses. I guess you're talking about the mysterious object. I actually did a poll on uh, the community tab of, of my YouTube channel. So uh, we've got some, some guesses going in there in that poll. I only have a finite number of poll options, so I couldn't put a whole bunch of different things. <laughs> Shout out to Sabrina. Saying that I remind her of a Baptist preacher. Mm -hmm. Would that be like Jerry Falwell Jr.? I hope not. Ricky says it's going to be solved here soon, I believe. John Kelly, the profiler, receives all the info, data files, and monitoring reports. I mean, I hope the case is solved soon. I mean, we thought it was going to be solved soon at the year mark or the year and a half or two year mark uh, when a certain former police officer was the main suspect and he checked a lot of boxes. So um, that didn't work out. So, um, so we'll see if the current trend that cops are on or if it's going to work out or not. Certainly hope it does. Where are we at? We're at uh, three minutes. Three minutes, and then we'll do this watch party. Elliot Ness says, oh boy, pulpit master. I guess better a pulpit master than a puppet master. Well, we got about 41 people in here, guys. That's um, I haven't done that many live uh, YouTubes. This is maybe the third one or fourth one. I think the third one. And uh, so this is a record. So congratulations, guys, for showing up. I'm going to go ahead and... Let's see. My screen go away there for a second? I think it did. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go on over on my phone to CBS DFW. And you may be able to hear the audio. I'm not not sure here. Okay, watch now. Okay. tricky thing about this is I lose my access to the comments, so I'm going to go over here on the other device. There we go. All right, it's 10 o'clock, so it should be, should be coming up. Where's the audio, though?
Why did we lose the audio? Did you guys lose the audio on yours? Joseph Dale says he's hearing it just fine. For some reason, my sound went away, though. Huh. All right, well, I'm going to try. Okay. Well, dang it, I had it for a second, and then it... Went away again. I'm going to try going to their site, see what's happening there. Okay. Ever hired at the law school here? I was the second ever hired on the tenure track of any University of California law school. And when I was tenured, I guess you guys are seeing a lady who's talking about being on a tenure track, University of California law school, something like that. at the time that I was growing up in the 70s was pretty much a segregated city. The valley, the long, the Rio Grande, hmm. it was all... Well, guys, I hope this is going to work out. You know, up at the top, it says CBSN Dallas-Fort Worth will return soon. You're watching CBSN, which is, um, I guess, the national network feed rather than the local feed. I mean, you know, it'd be this kind of thing where so, a small number of white kids in my high school... I don't know if anybody's local that could actually turn on the CBS station. Um, take a look there and see if you're catching anything there. I hope we're not running any problems with local channels, you know, and us being outside the local area. I didn't really think about that, and I may not have anything to do with it. But Yeah, affirmative action. So I, I don't, uh, I don't know what that is. We're, I'm just gonna let that play. Um, you guys keep an eye on it and uh, let me know if it changes and if there's something about Missy Beavers. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's just gonna be later in the broadcast. Maybe it'll be ten fifteen or something. So in the meantime, um, let's get caught up and see. See what's going on here. Yeah, Phoebe, it, it does say that at the top, and I don't know, you know, what that means. I just know that right now we're getting a national feed. Um, so we can move on uh, to maybe talking a little bit about that mysterious object. Um, and if you guys have any questions about the Missy Beavers case, obviously today I should have said this um, up front. You know, today, obviously, uh, for those who don't know, is the five year anniversary of the death of Missy Beavers. Um, she was killed around 420 in the morning uh, on April 18th of 2016. So it's kind of why we're gathering here tonight. Um, to to remember her, hopefully to remember her life more than her death, and um, to talk about the case and where where the case stands as well. Um, I um, I posted a tribute video called Legacy um, to my YouTube channel late last night. Um, 
I don't really have a way to share the screen and show it here, but um, later on, take a take a look at that. And that was something that um, that I sent to Brandon Beavers to share with family and you know other loved ones who knew and loved Missy, so that uh, so that they would have that as kind of a reminder of what Missy was about. You know, I, in in the month of April. A lot of people are going to be in the news talking about the way that Missy died. And I wanted to put out something that was more of a celebration of her life than, um, than anything to do with how her life ended. So if you get a chance, take a look at that. I think it turned out pretty good as, as just a memorial of, of Missy's life and a celebration of her life. And, uh, Brandon seemed to seem to think that it was pretty good. Uh, So a few days ago, um, and, and most of you probably know this, oh, Andrea Coates, uh, 499 thank you very much for that super chat. I appreciate that very much. And if anyone does a super chat and I miss it, I apologize in advance. I'm going to try to keep up with everything, and um, I, think that was, I think that was it. That was the one so far. So... Uh, Joseph Dale has a question. What do you think about the face that Aaron Stoner caught on the surveillance tape? Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, I didn't see much detail in what he captured. Um, but I will bring up someone who was in here earlier, and um, I don't, I can't see a list of participants. So uh, Nen, or No It's Not, is um, from Web Sleuths. And she has done some remarkable work on the face of the Altima driver. And she comes up with something different from what Aaron Stoner did. And uh, it shows the driver with a light colored balaclava uh, over the face and over the, the top of the nose. And um, it's pretty impressive. So um, rather than try to go get her picture, and she did give me permission I say she, I don't even know if no, it's not as male or female, <laughs> but, um, or we call her no, it's not, or just NIN as an acronym. But, um, but what I'm going to do is I will post to my YouTube channel, um, that photo that she did that shows the balaclava covering the face. And yeah, I have a hard time saying that word. I want to say baklava, but that's like a Greek, uh, dessert, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, that uh, to me, that is more compelling than than the Aaron Stoner one that just looked like a blob with a black spot or two in it to me. So, um, and Joseph says the sketch that he had done based on the surveillance. I mean, somebody came up with a sketch based on a blob, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and and no offense to Aaron Stoner, but. Um, uh, I, I didn't see anything that I could have made a sketch from, is, is what I'm saying. But I did watch I did watch his video and I've watched his other videos and you know he's he's putting a lot of effort into it. I'll give him that. But um, I would just caution people to, you know, if you see something that someone has done as a sketch or uh, image enhancement or whatever, um, use your common sense when you're comparing it to what can really be seen there and, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but there are some professionals out there who are doing some good work. And I think, uh, no, it's not is one of them. And I'll put her photo up later for you guys to take a look at and judge for yourselves. Sure thing, Joseph. That's what I'm here for. Try to answer questions as I can. Taking a look over here at uh, the CBS DFW feed, and they're uh, still not talking about Missy Beavers. So we'll we'll just continue on with our doing our thing here. Um, so a few days ago, the Midlothian police gave an update of sorts on the case, which was good because at the four-year mark, they did not release any information at all. It came and went with no acknowledgement. Um, sorry, hang on a sec. Try 
trying to keep up with everything here. So Joseph Dale, your message is on the screen. And I don't know how to make it go away. That's interesting. Ah, there we go. All right, made it go away. Let's see if we have any other questions. But yeah, Midlothian Police came out with a press release and they, they pretty much reiterated things that came out at the three-year mark uh, regarding the fact that uh, they believe that collaboration with the public will be something that cracks this case, in their opinion. Um, they talk about the Altima and say that they still want to talk to the Altima. They say that it may be an infinity, which I don't agree with, but that's what they say. Um, and then they, they mentioned there, there's some new people in the police department. So I think this is something positive, something that we can be hopeful for, um, that uh, they have a new federal retired agent who is now part of their team, and it, his primary responsibility is looking at the case. And if he's a retired Fed, I'm assuming FBI. I'm assuming this is somebody who's pretty darn good. Um, and they have uh, put him to work. And um, so, so we'll see what comes of that. And then the other thing is the commander of the criminal investigative division, which is the division that has the detectives that work on the criminal cases, including homicides. The, uh, the boss over that division is a new guy who has like, I think, 27 years of homicide experience for a major agency. I believe it's the city of Arlington. I don't know if the press release said Arlington, but I think through other information that I have, I think it's Arlington. So this guy's got solid background. And uh, between him and the retired federal agent, and then, um, you know, there's been a lot of turnover. Your assistant police chief, Kevin Johnson, left, and so they've got Scott Brown to replace him. Um, they've got detectives in the CID who work on the Missy Beavers case pretty closely, and they transferred over from um, Mansfield, I believe, where they had worked on some homicide cases. So, um, you know, so, so they definitely had a, a changing of the guard. Uh, pretty much everybody's new over there except for Chief Smith and a few others. Um, I see you guys are talking about the newscast. Um, so is anybody like watching the local feed in DFW and is it something different from what we're seeing on this CBS DFW? Shiva's girl says, do you, do they still stick with the bumper sticker? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, in this press release, no, they did not mention the bumper sticker. So I don't know. Um, they may have heard that I've said some things about how I don't believe there's a bumper sticker. Um, so I wonder if, you know, maybe they don't know or care that I've said that, but then again, maybe it caused them to go back and look and uh, rethink things. Uh, or maybe they decided long ago there was no bumper sticker and they just never corrected it but uh, I sure don't see one I could be wrong but I don't see one Linda Calloway thank you for joining us I uh, think CBS DFW would be the local channel yeah I mean I don't know if people are seeing locally on their televisions something different from what this is showing us um, on the CBS DFW side, it may be, it may be different. Wish we'd known that, apologize. But uh, that's not all we're talking about. Okay, Eddie M says they showed the whole segment here in DFW local channel on TV and mentioned another segment tomorrow at 10. Okay, so they just don't broadcast their local uh, feed on this CBS DFW side. I guess they're not allowed to do that. 
or whatever. So uh, Eddie, uh, if you or anyone else could could kind of give us a review, was there anything new? Um, was it just sort of a review of what's happened over the last five years, or did they cover any new ground? I'm interested in what you saw there. And maybe, you know, between now and tomorrow or Tuesday, I can get my hands on on what they did, and then we can do another live later on next week, maybe, and, um, and talk about it. So, okay, we talked about uh, the Midlothian press release, covered that pretty well. There's, um, there's just not, um, not a whole lot that was new there other than telling us about the personnel changes. Um, so, you know, we can be hopeful that, uh, that maybe something is going to break this year. Um, you know, the five-year mark, I don't think anybody, public or police alike, um, felt like there was any way this case would go five years, but it has. Uh, M3 Industries uh, wants to know, did you tell us what uh, SP, the SWAT perp, was carrying in the church? No, uh, I have not, because we've been talking about other things. We were kind of watching this CBS feed to see if it would show the Missy Beaver segment, which it did not. Uh, and we talked about the uh, Midlothian press release that they put out a few days ago. Um, and uh, so let me, if I can, go back to, as you guys are, are talking here, I'm going to go find a picture so that I can Um, so that I can bring up. All right. Let's see. All right. I guess you guys can see in the middle of the screen. That is what the object is. There's actually three of those little storage trays from Walmart that are banded together, and that's how they sell them. But what the SWAT perp is carrying in his hand, or her hand, is one of those trays. It's about nine inches long. It's about five inches across and about two inches deep. And you can see those little slotted holes when you look at the uh, surveillance video from the church it's really kind of pixelated and it looks zigzagged and not straight up and down uh, but uh, but this is what it is this is what he's carrying and and it's not empty uh, but what's what's in there I'm not going to go into detail on because I do believe that uh, police need to be able to hold on to things that only the killer would know. Um, and I don't think it really matters that much if, uh, if we let out the information about the basket here. But inside the basket would have been some small items that uh, the killer picked up this basket from room 10. Um, in that scene where you see him coming out of a door and then he starts to hammer into the vertical window of another door toward the end of the video, um, that's uh, he picked that up from the room that he was coming out of, room 10. Uh, where did I get that photo from, Shiva's girl? Uh, that photo is, uh, that's not the killer, okay? <laughs> that that photo is someone in Walmart uh, buying that item or carrying that item for purposes of buying it. Okay. So don't worry about where that photo came from. That was just uh, to get that picture so that you would know that that's, that's what that is. Uh, what was room 10 used for? Dee is asking. 
Uh, room 10 was the youth worship room. Um, so it's a, it's a really large room with uh, two doors, two entrances in and out of it. Uh, and it's at the northeast end of the uh, church. And, uh, you know, a lot of people wanted to speculate that what the killer had in their hand was, uh, you know, a box with a knife in it or a gun case, uh, basically something to kill Missy with. Um, based on what I know about this basket and about the small tools that were in it, um, I don't think that there was necessarily anything in this basket that this killer would have used to kill Missy. In fact, this basket didn't stay in his hand very long because after he hammered out that glass of that door, um, when he came back around to go into the auditorium, he had already put that basket down. It wouldn't fit in a pocket and it wasn't in his hand anymore. Now, it's possible he might have taken one or two small things out of that basket and put them in his vest. But um, Elliot Ness is asking, do we know it's empty or assume maybe the killer dumped it out, but why carry it around? Um, no, it, it had some things in it, Elliot. It was not empty. Um, but... You know, when I say small tools, it's, it's not the kind of tools that anybody would use to kill somebody with. Um, but I don't want to get more specific as to what those things were. Emerald Eyes uh, says, was the box found anywhere inside? Did the perp leave it behind? Yes, the perp left it behind. Um, yes, it was it was still there in the church. Um the church is aware of it. That particular basket, as far as I know, is still there and still being used. <laughs> Phoebe says crayons. Yeah, well, probably not crayons. One would hope that the youth uh, in their room 10 would have graduated beyond crayons uh, needing to be in there. Phoebe wants to know, did he bring the basket to the church or did he pick it up inside the church? No, he picked it up inside the church in room 10. DDS, are there many of these same baskets inside room 10? Um, they do have more baskets. Um, it's not just one basket, but I don't know how many. Wishing B says, are you saying the police found it in the church? Um, I don't know if police were the ones who found it or if it was the church members that came up there that found it. Don't know that for sure. And I don't know where the perp discarded this basket but I think there's really only three options either room nine inside room nine or on the hallway floor between room nine and room 14 or inside room 14 because those are the only places left before the killer comes around to the, the hallway that the auditorium and the Dutch door are on and comes back up that direction and enters the auditorium we know he doesn't have the basket then, and we know that he had been in all of the external facing rooms um, from room 10 to room uh, 14, 15, whatever. Um, so he's coming back to rooms 9 and 14. So we had to either leave it in those two rooms, one of those two rooms, or just throwing it down on the floor. Um, I doubt he would have gone back into room 10 to put it back. And if he had, then nobody would know that he had it, <laughs> uh, other than the video. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's a little underwhelming when you know exactly what it is. 
a lot of people wanted to think of some kind of Dexter style kill box, but um, it's really kind of mundane. Greedy Gred is asking about whether there might have been something in the basket to pick a lock. Um, don't think so. Denise says, why did he have to kill her if it wasn't planned? Well, good question. This always comes up when we talk about untargeted versus targeted. Um, and those who believe that Missy was targeted want to use that, you know, to question those who think that it was untargeted. And, and the question is, why, do, why does this burglar, if that's what they were there for, why did they kill Missy um, when they didn't have to? Um, you know, it's a good question. My answer to that is always, why does anybody kill somebody else? It's, it's, it's never necessary to kill someone. Um, but burglars, muggers, robbers, home invaders kill people all the time in the course of committing another crime. Um, it has a category in the statutes of, of criminal law called felony murder. When you commit murder while you're in the midst of committing some other act. So it happens. Um, sometimes it's a twitchy finger on a trigger. Um, sometimes maybe Missy um, might have not gone quietly. Maybe she forced the issue. Maybe she wasn't letting the person leave. We don't know. That's speculation. But um, bottom line is that people kill people when they don't have to, when they're in the course of robbing a convenience store, robbing a bank, uh, invading a home, and they encounter the homeowner, um, taking a guy's wallet off the street, and they don't have to kill him, but they do after he's given them his wallet. Um, it just it just happens. Uh, we we can't expect criminals to do the common sense thing, which is, gosh, somebody just came in the church and um, I need to get out of here and I need to let them live. You know, it'd be nice if criminals thought that way, but often they don't. Uh, Shiva's girl, I, um, I I'm a journalist, and journalists do not uh, reveal their sources. Um, I have sources that uh, I was able to get this information, and uh, but I, I don't reveal my sources. It's up to you to choose whether to believe me or not. Emerald Eyes says, churches have become major targets for burglaries over the years. Thank you for saying that, Emerald Eyes, because that's really important. Um, and, and there are articles out there I could provide you links to about how there's been an explosion of burglaries in churches. Um, it's no longer the safe haven, no longer the sanctuary in a lot of people's mind. Um, churches are not untouchable anymore. Uh, that's kind of sad to say. But uh, but yeah, Joel Osteen has a large mega church in Houston. Um, they meet in a former NBA arena, and um, they had a break-in, and they had... Um, Five or six hundred thousand dollars in cash and uh, credit card transactions and stuff like that um, stolen, and it was between Sunday at the last service and Monday when the people came in to work. So same kind of time frame as Missy, just uh, nobody walked in on them. Denise says, I guess I just don't want to think it could have been so random. Maybe they surprised each other in the end was she died. And, and I think you hit on something uh, really important here. I, I think in true crime, when we follow a case, 
kind of the last thing on our list that we fall to is that it was random, that it was a stranger, that it was someone who didn't know she was going to be there and she didn't know they were going to be there and wrong place, wrong time. We, when we follow true crime, are always looking at the players, you know, the, the husband, the uh, boyfriend, uh, the lover, the uh, spouse of a lover. Um, and when we're trying to sleuth it, you know, we've got these people to look at and to dig into. Um, if it's something random, if it's a burglary, there's not much we can do with that, is there? There's not much we can do with that. And so that's kind of boring. You know, if that's what it is. Um, and I think that's why most people don't want to consider the untargeted angle. Now, I'm not saying that this was untargeted on Missy. Um, that's the way I lean, but we need to be open. We need to look at everything. All right, let me get caught up on a few comments here. Oh, this is interesting. Emerald Eyes says, um, they asked a veteran detective if taking your time during a burglary was common. He said, yes, very often. They are methodical and take their time. And see, that is so anti what a lot of the stereotype is that you hear. But this is the same thing that I've been saying. In Midlothian, this church is on a rural highway. It's raining. It's three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. Why rush if you don't think anybody's going to be there? Why rush? Rowan, too. Here's a question. Um, did the first camp gladiator who waited in the parking lot see anything? Did they see a car leaving? No, they did not see anything. And in fact, there's a police report uh, from the scene that I've read where um, they have a quote from the camper to police in which uh, that camper specifically said, didn't see a car, didn't see anything. I think the timing was probably that the killer was gone by 425. And... Uh, the first camper got there around 4.30 to 4.35. So it was 10 minutes or less, but I think it was a window in which that killer was already out on the highway traveling away from the church when the camper pulled in. Yep, here's here's a comment. We're still still 50-50 on the targeted versus untargeted issue. Yep, it's, um, it's a difficult one to figure out for sure. And we need to keep looking at both. And I certainly hope that police are looking at both. Okay, I think I'm caught up on questions for now. I can figure out how to make this basket go away. <laughs> I'm going to take that off the screen. If uh, you guys want to get a screenshot of it, now's the time to do it because it is about to go away. And boom. i got to figure out this StreamYard stuff. I used to be really technically proficient with software and stuff back when I worked in the software field. And now I just kind of feel old and dumb. Oh, okay. Well, you guys ready to get into the virtual tour? Okay. And this is a, again, something where I'm going to have to technically figure out how to make that happen. Give me just a second here. Okay, 
I'm going to turn the volume down here. Give me just a minute here because I wanted to skip past something where it showed somebody where I didn't want it to do that. All right. Hopefully you guys are able to see this okay. I want to point out, first of all, this tour is starting in the auditorium. And those doors that you see in front of you that I've got it paused on right now, those are the doors that the, uh, the killer walks through at the end of the Midlothian police video. When they come walking up, you know, across from there is the Dutch door room that, uh, that they had entered earlier. So they, they turn right into a little alcove, and that's right where these doors are. You're seeing them from the inside of the auditorium. But those are the doors. Okay. Now I'm going to continue on. And if it's the way it was in 2016, there's just a little table there inside those doors. And notice the floor. The floor is like stained concrete. It's not carpeted. Okay, so these are the entrance doors that are across from room one and room two. Um, you're going to see holy grounds here in a minute. That's the entrance that Missy came in, right there. That is the southwest entrance. Okay, and that's Holy Grounds. It's got the, the weird louvered door that you saw in the video. Yeah, church video. There's a little door there that I guess people that are going to work in that Holy Grounds area, go through that door. Southwest entrance bathroom. That's the men's room. It's right there inside the doors. Um, you know, to your left as you walk in the entrance. The men's room is right there. Uh, then you see there's a wall with a clock on it and a water fountain. And to the right, just out of frame, is the women's bathroom. So when campers needed to use the restroom, they didn't have to go far inside the church. Missy would unlock the doors, and the bathrooms were right here. Let's take a drink. We're thirsty. Same clock as four years ago, five years ago, rather. Another look at Holy Grounds. Okay, and this is the Dutch door hallway. You see that alcove on the left, that's, that's where the killer went into the auditorium, which was his last known location in the video that we saw. And there's the Dutch door. Okay. What you're seeing in front of you is the door that has a one by it, and then the bulletin board, and then uh, room two. Uh, room one to the left of the billboard is the room that the killer sort of kind of tried to break into, pry into, and then gave up on. That is a janitorial closet. There's nothing in there but cleaning supplies. It doesn't have a vertical window the way a lot of the other doors do. All right.
right now we're getting into the main entrance foyer. There's a little column, little column that we just passed, and then you can see at the far end there's another column. Um, so columns at either end of the um, of the foyer, and it's kind of two stories here, so it goes way way up. Um, but you can see the entrance doors. It's kind of a weird little box uh, where, where people walk in. And just on the other side, you saw that person in the blue shirt just went into Kelsey's place. That is a um, basically a playground, an indoor playground for the kids. But it's uh, it's also known as room three, so. All the rooms have numbers on them, and that is room three. And as we walk further, that is also room three. That's also the indoor playground that has the glass window where parents can look through and check on their kids. Then we saw room four briefly. Um, the door kind of blew past us. And then you've got uh, some furniture there. Whoops, what just happened? Hang on, guys. Let's start this back over. Oh, I didn't need to go back that far, did I? Okay. We're walking past the furniture. Past room four, that's room five. Straight in front of you is room five. And then that's the northwest entrance. Northwest entrance. And then we hang a right. And um, room six was the first room. And then we get to room seven, which is the kitchen. And you can see there's um, some roll down doors, or windows, I should say, that um, they use for serving food. There's two doors into room seven. And then as you proceed, you've got two doors to room eight ahead of you. And the, the nearer door to room eight, the one that um, is furthest from that entrance, is the one that the killer came out of. And he took a ride and he walked past the kitchen. All right. So that's, that's the northeast entrance. Those, those doors were busted and broken, and plywood was put over them um, as part of the crime scene cleanup. So those doors that you saw were damaged. This is a little alcove that has a men's and women's restroom. Okay, that's it as far as that video goes. Now, I've got some other, other video if I can get to it. Just give me a second to think about how to do that. Let's go away. 
right. So, so what did you guys think about what you saw so far? That's not the complete tour, but it's uh, part of the way there. Before I bring some other pictures and stuff up, I'm just going to take a look at some of y'all's comments. Shiva's girl brings up the creepy message. Yeah, a creepy message was something that was mentioned in a search warrant that while Missy was in Austin, which she was on a trip a few days uh, before she was murdered, had just gotten back from that, you know, a day or so before the murder um, with the Camp Gladiator. She was down there for a conference. And while down there, uh, a friend of hers reported that Missy had gotten a creepy message on her phone from someone she didn't know and she showed the message to this friend and they agreed that it was creepy and that was it. The friend didn't know or remember the name of the person that sent the message or, and, and we've never been told what the message was. So that's all we know about that. Was it connected? Maybe, maybe not. Because, sad to say, Women get creepy messages all the time, and they don't always get murdered. Uh, da -da -da -da. Wishing B, okay, you're saying that looking at that video, it shows that the church is bigger than you thought, especially if there's an upstairs. Well, there's not an upstairs. It's just one level, but it is 192 feet by 168 feet. So that's, that's pretty substantial. I think that's 30,000 square feet. And no, those of you in the UK or wherever who don't use the imperial system, I'm not going to convert that to metric for you because I'm not that smart. Shiva's girl says, is there video of him leaving the church? Mm, police say that there was video inside the church of the killer going up a hallway, presumably to leave the way that he entered. There is not video, as far as we know, of a vehicle leaving the church. Um, and then again, this is just relying on what police have told us. All right, y'all give me a second here to see. What else I can come up with here. Okay. Let me pause that right there. Okay, the door just to your left that's open, that is room 17. That is where the church keeps its files on the prison ministry that they have. There are inmates, both male and female, that take Bible classes or correspondence courses through this church. And so the files that the church uses to keep up with those inmates uh, and keep up with their grades and whatnot are in that room, room 17. Which, from what I've heard, what I've been told, that room was the most disturbed room in the church. Doesn't mean anything was taken, nothing was taken, but just in terms of things being in disarray, things being out of place, um, for some reason, that room 17 was the most disturbed. 
Next to that is room 18, which is an office. And then you get to 19. Howdy. I don't need audio on this. Let me turn the audio off. Okay, this is 19. This is the, the main suite of offices in this church. Um, this would be where the pastor's office is, the uh, secretary, the youth pastor, uh, music minister. Um, so there's individual offices in here. And you get a glimpse as you walk by of uh, there's a chair there and a lamp and some stuff on the wall. Room 20. And then the next room is the Dutch door room, room 21. So that shows you that hallway. Just trying to think if I have a good way of showing you. I've got a few other pictures, but... Uh, Hmm. Okay, let's see. All right, see this picture? This is room 10. This is the room that the killer picked up that basket. This is the room that the killer was walking out of when they hammered into room 9, which is across the hallway, just out of sight on the right. Trying to bring up another picture, but it's taking its own time. Wishing B, was there an entrance to the offices from 17? Um, wishing B, I believe that you could go between room 16 and room 20 without without having to uh, go out into the hallway. I think there are interior doors that are connecting all those. Okay, just for reference, I showed you a second ago that hallway with room 10. This is that same hallway actually from the church video. This is as the killer is walking out of that room and about to hammer away across the way. This will be good. Okay. That hallway that we were just showing you, the offices, this is a photo from the other end shooting back the other way. So down at the far end, next to the entrance, is room 15. And then you've got 16. Um, in between 16 and 17, you can't really see it there, but I think there's like a unisex bathroom there. And then you've got 17 and 18 together, and then 19 is that suite of offices, and then uh, room 20. 
and the only other room would be room 21. I know somewhere I've got a photo of the hallway that has um, this this same, not this hallway, but the one that has room 10, but down at the other end, shooting from that direction. Um, but I'm not sure where it is. If I can find it, I'll bring it up, but I don't want to do a lot of fumbling around here and boring all you guys. Let me uh, let me just kind of go through and see if there's been any other comments to talk about here. Yeah, I like what Elliot said here. If uh, it was a targeted murder, it's a hard way to kill a person that way, you know, because you're killing them inside the church when you could have just waited outside and killed them as they got out of their vehicle. So, yep, that's a good point. trying to remember how to make uh, some of these things go away. There we go. All right. Um, 20 is the Xerox room. Uh, yes. Yes, I think there's just a copier in there, not, not a whole lot else. <laughs> Shiva's girl says, why wear a headlamp, though? Was he planning on going mining? <laughs> well, you know, when you've got a hammer in one hand and you know, that basket in the other hand or a pry tool or whatever, uh, kind of difficult to carry a flashlight too. So it really kind of came in handy to have that light up on the helmet. I'll tell you another way it comes in handy. A lot of those rooms in that church have motion activated lights, not just a standard light switch that you have to switch on. You walk into the room, the lights come on. So the benefit of having that, that uh, light on the helmet is that a person could open the door shine the light in from the helmet mounted lighting and not have to actually walk into the room. Um, so I don't know, kind of, kind of worked out well for them to, to have that lighting. All right. Here's a question from Joseph Dale. Tim, would you confirm to these internet sleuths that she was last seen walking down a hallway toward the perp because she looked startled by what was most likely the burglar smashing things. Well, I mean, I can confirm everything but the smashing things um, because I don't know what got her attention. It could have been anything. Uh, the killer might have even still been in the auditorium at that point. Maybe he was just walking around. Um, you know, they've got that uh, concrete floor, so footsteps from a boot are going to make a sound. In an empty church, it's going to echo. So maybe she heard footsteps and nothing more. Maybe it wasn't so much what she heard as what she saw. Maybe she looked down that long hallway, and, and you could see from the video, you know, these hallways, one end to the other, 192 feet. If anybody's in a hallway, you can see them. Um, so there's no audio on the video. So all we know is that uh, she walked in and she looked toward her left. 
you know, down that hallway. Whether it was something she saw or something she heard, we had no way of knowing. Um, okay, we had a question from Sally Scott. Did he film it? Did the killer film um, the murder? Um, you know, there was some confusion in a search warrant. The way it was worded kind of made it sound like um, the killer might have used a phone to record, you know, activities while he was in the church. But police clarified that later. Um, that wasn't what they meant. And they said that uh, there was nothing to indicate that that he did that so as far as we know no okay what else we got did she film it yeah we don't know if it's a he or a she I try to use the pronoun they, not because I think that this person is non-binary, but uh, because I'm just trying to be simple, because I don't want to say he or she. Who reported that the biggest disturbance was in room 17? I can't reveal my sources. Wishing B just went back to the map, 16 through 20 are offices. 17 being the most messed with room makes it even more likely a robbery. Yeah, I'll tell you a theory I, I came to pretty recently. You remember in the church video where the killer is doing the half-hearted attempt to break into room one and they're trying to pry into it and they're turning their head and they're messing with their vest and they're looking sort of directly toward the camera and in that direction. Well, in that direction that they're looking is a sign painted onto the wall that has an arrow and says offices. So it's my speculation that they were looking for the offices. That's why they're in this church. They're just kind of systematically making their way around to where they think money might be stored. And I think that's why they kind of give up on that half-hearted attempt to go into room one. They're pretty sure that there's nothing in there anyway. They see a sign, oh, the offices, they're down here. And so then they go around to that hallway and they start with room 21 and continue systematically um, until they get to those offices down there. And I think, you know, possibly maybe by the time they get to room 17, after they've gone in 19 and 20 and 18 and uh, looked through all that stuff and not really found any money, no deposit bag in a drawer because this church does not keep their deposit on site. Um, they get 17 and maybe they're taking out some frustration. That's a possibility. Yeah, Joseph Dale, I listened to a podcast this morning that was 45 minutes long. It was about this case, and they interviewed um, a woman who was a homicide detective in the Midwest. And despite her saying that, you know, you need to keep looking at all avenues, um, she never once even mentioned untargeted as a theory. It's like targeted is the only option. <laughs> Um, in 45 minutes, burglary, random, those words were never used one time. It just amazes me, you know, when people bring in interviews with people who are good, people who are experienced, but those people don't take the time to really do a deep dive into the case and know what's going on. You know, this detective didn't mention a handgun either. You know, we know by now there was a gun involved. Um, so it, it, it kind of, it kind of ruins the whole involvement of an expert. If the expert is not armed with enough information to, to draw good conclusions, the saying that I use all the time, 
mantra I use is faulty assumptions lead to faulty conclusions. People just need to look at all sides and they need to make sure that they understand everything in the background of this case because everything's important until we find out for sure that something is unimportant. All right, what else, guys? Yeah, that you said it better than me, Gritty Grit. Frustrating to listen to an expert give opinions when they don't know all the facts. Yeah, and you know, Chris McDonough from the interview room, um, he did something on the case before I met him and talked to him. Um, he did kind of an initial look at the case, and he got some things wrong because he didn't spend enough time on it. He thought that Missy came in through uh, the wrong entrance and not the one that she, in fact, used. Um, and, and there were some other things he got wrong. But he reached out to me, and we had several multi-hour conversations about this case. And he paid attention to detail. And then we did um, another podcast uh, after he really had a grip on things. So I appreciated that about him. He's a, he's a homicide detective with 500 death cases of experience and uh, knows his stuff. Ah, Joseph Dale, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. Ah, you work as an airline pilot. You weren't the airline pilot who reported this small dark SUV passing the church at 4.30, were you? Um, it actually was an airline pilot that reported that. But uh, I'm sure that wasn't you. I'm sure you wouldn't admit it if it was you. But uh, yeah, go to bed and fly safely tomorrow. And thank you for the super chat. Okay, uh, if room 17 was records of criminals, then could someone have been breaking into the room in order to destroy records? I asked that question. Um, I was told that police did pursue that avenue, and it was a dead end, and they didn't really find anything. But, uh, but yeah, that was the first thing that came to my mind, that, okay, these are inmate records, and here's a person in the middle of a criminal act doing the most damage in a room of inmate records. So... Definitely was something to ask questions about, but apparently police did not find anything fruitful in their search there. You think the killer left on foot or bike? Uh, neither. I think the killer left by car. Um, it was just too messy, and there, it's a rural highway, 75 mile an hour traffic that nobody would leave any way other than by car. That's my opinion. Uh, was it this particular Monday an off school day for her children? Who's her? I must have missed something. Who are you referring to? If it's who I think you're referring to, um, there's a person who I think has gotten uh, the shaft <laughs> by uh, being brought up repeatedly um, when I don't think they had anything to do with anything in this case. You're referring to a female named Courtney Tucker, who was in the target list of nine names, along with her husband, A.J. Tucker, who's a camp gladiator instructor. And there's a uh, small, very vocal contingent of people on the Internet who constantly are saying that Courtney Tucker did it. Um, I don't think she did. And I think the only reason her name was brought into it is um, because when they were getting phone records uh, with that target list, I think they were interested in AJ because AJ had just seen Missy and Austin. Um, and I think uh, with cell phone records, usually 
they can get the spouse's records the same as they can get the first spouse because it's usually joint names on an account. So I think they, they included Courtney because they could, not because they suspected her. I could be wrong about that, but uh, I've never seen anything other than just unfounded internet rumor where Courtney Tucker is concerned. Okay, did SWFA ever look later on their videos to see if they catch the car turning around? Don't know the answer to that question. But I'm sure that police do. Um, I know that SWFA turned over eight hours from that night of video from every exterior camera, which I think there were 17 of them. So it was a huge amount of footage. In fact, the police department had to go get uh, an external hard drive. They had to purchase one and bring it in to copy all that footage from SWFA's system. Yeah, and about, to the, about the Tuckers, uh, Elliot says AJ was doing a class on the other side of Midlothian at the same time. That's correct. So AJ definitely was not the person in the church. Um, and uh, AJ and Courtney had like four kids, including a child under the age of one, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so for her to have taken off and done this, it just there was just uh, nothing pointing to that. Yeah, um, Ricky, I, respectfully, I think you're overthinking it. Um, Nobody, nobody in Texas is going to go off into the woods like that uh, in rain and darkness. Um, properties are divided off with barbed wire fences usually. Um, there, there's no way anybody would have done that. I think we need to look for simple solutions and uh, only look to the complicated ones if the simple ones don't satisfy. And to me, the simple solution is that this person had a car, um, either they drove or somebody drove them, and that was the getaway car, and it was parked right outside the door. Um, after the murder, they just went out and hopped in the car and left. Thank you, Elliot. I appreciate that. I'll take a look at that when we're done here. Okay, VV, you'd go through a stream in woods if you were desperate. Okay, but this person wasn't desperate when they went to the church. They went to the church in a vehicle. So, yeah, they're desperate afterward. They just killed somebody. They're panicked, but they're not going to go off and leave their car. Okay, guys. Well, I think uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, we've been at it for well over an hour, hour and a half. So uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm sorry that it didn't work out with the watch party, but um, we were able to talk about a lot of things and do the tour and look at the basket uh, that was the mysterious object. So um, I hope you all enjoyed this, and we'll do this again real soon. Um, we'll see you next time. Y'all stay safe.